Turn my volume down too. We are waiting. We are live. Looks like Matt Clow is already tuned in as well as, hey, look at that, 20 other people. That is cool, cool beans right there. Congratulations, guys, on joining the gang squad this morning. Woohoo! We actually even made it up on time this morning. Uh, cool. Let us know. Audio feed, video feed. Make um, sure everything's tasting really good. Yeah, for those of you tuned in already, throw a couple comments right down. I think we actually got it sorted out today, though, unlike most times. We might be on top of our game right <laughs> now. There is a possibility. I did have to wake up my whole family. So, you know, there's that, too. Norway, brewing saisons. Ooh, yeah, saisons. Sounds now is actually a perfect time to brew saison, too. I, I'm a big fan of letting saisons age for a couple months and do their things. Um, yeah, everybody's saying that we're looking beautiful. So, Well, that's uh, um, kind of always the case. We just want to make sure it's happening on camera as well. <laughs> All right, welcome mm -hmm. to the Genus Brewing Sunday Live show. We've got a cool lineup of things to talk about today, including a little bit of drama, maybe, in the uh, in the in the beer world, it's not really drama. It's just drama from Peter. What? What? I'm not dramatic. You're dramatic. No, you shut up. Uh, so we've got something to talk about with Untapped a little bit later, as well as a spectrum of sours and talking about what um, starts. What's the low end of sourness for sours? What's the high end of sourness from sours? Where you get those? Uh, every week we also talk about a beer of the week, which this week will be a surprise. And then uh, we got we talk about some genius news at the very beginning. So let's uh, way to way to break that down in perfect <laughs> chronological order. That's exactly how the show goes, guys. <laughs> Just take that, flip it backwards on itself, and then you've got yourself what we do. All right, we got got a lot of people tuning in. So let's go ahead and start out this live stream uh, with some uh, genius news. We uh, have a two barrel tank that you guys learned about last week. We were a little bit unsure of if our tiny little glycol chiller would be able to chill three other vessels and still crash that two barrel vessel all the way down. And we found out it does. So yeah, it is down to, it's not a perfect crash. I will say that. Yeah. Um, we did sort of have to janky up the, uh, it came with that we did not put in the video a neoprene, neoprene jacket. jacket for it, and we kind of janky rigged that around it. I think we might be able to get another degree or two Fahrenheit down um, if we actually put that on properly. But somebody apparently was was too enamored by the shininess, so they oh, did. I like watching shiny things be shiny. Yes, yeah, so, so he yeah, didn't we, actually we, we put the jacket on. We went ahead and put on. the neoprene jacket on, and Logan immediately spilled a bunch of beer all over that neoprene jacket. Sure did. Like within minutes. <laughs> So we know it's washable now. <laughs> it is very it cleaned up really easy, actually. <laughs> um, but yeah, so we've got that beer down to um, it was sitting at 39 degrees Fahrenheit uh, yesterday. Uh, so, yeah, our first batch of IPA is crashed in it. Um, the carb stone is definitely like I think Peter mentioned an absolute beast. Uh, I turned that sucker on and yeah, it got it up up to uh, 15 PSI within about 20, 15 minutes, maybe even. It was, it was, I ran up front, ran back, and it was immediately running, so, uh, um, but the one issue we have run into, which I think is just um, a user error, is the large part of the lid portion did seem to be leaking a little bit, so I had to turn it off, and it kind of settled down at about um, 12 PSI, so, uh, so that might be something that if somebody else is out there purchasing one of these little two-barrel um, uni tanks to really kind of make sure that that large large lid portion is, is uh, seated properly with that gasket and then you're probably going to have to really crank down on that triclo fitting to uh, make sure that it doesn't leak out of there mostly just make sure the gasket isn't uh, isn't squiggled yeah that's that's probably i think the the bigger situation we're running into right now but either way i mean it's it's settled on about yeah 10 or 12 psi which is actually enough to get it carby carb so so it's looking good. Uh, we got some organization stuff. We uh, have slat wall pretty much everywhere here in the store side of the shop. And we got a bunch of new pegs and shelving for that. So that's always fun for us because the more we can get kind of up off the floor and more organized, the better the tap room part of this place yeah. looks. And so that's always a good thing. Uh, We've gotten, we're starting to get some yeast back in stock. So that's good to know on the supply chain side. Some things might be coming back into stock um soon ish maybe yeah we finally got we got flagship in this week right so yeah. golly that was uh that was way way overdue so imperial's flagship that's just their uh, american ale strain um they've been out of that for like two months now or something yeah which has been um, really hard on us because it's definitely the most popular yeast we sell we've kind of turned a lot of people onto imperial and so when we're not able to get like the most common yeast strain in imperial it's uh, a little bit hard but we did say you know it's not our fault it's the fact that we couldn't get it but yep 
Um, what else? Uh, uh, West Coast IPA kit. Yeah, so uh, I snuck it on. Nobody's probably seen it yet. Um, actually, I didn't check this morning, which probably makes sure nobody ordered one. Uh, um, yeah, but we did put up a West Coast IPA kit on our website if you guys want to check that out. And we'll be doing a How to West Coast IPA video release this Wednesday, I believe. Wednesday, yeah, Wednesday or Friday. Probably at some point by the end of this week. It's pretty much ready to go right now. So yep. uh, stay tuned for that video. Um, otherwise, you can check it out. We don't really... Peter's working on a really cool graphic for it as well. So. I, I am working on a really cool graphic. <laughs> you guys are going to be so excited. <laughs> I was really excited. No, no, I wasn't. Logan loved it. Uh, it'll, it'll be a throwback for all you guys. You'll, did, uh, they didn't get my hat right, okay? <laughs> well, there's when they put the color in it, then it'll be it'll look more like you. Uh, all right. Anyway, so that is uh, the news for the week. Otherwise, it's been you know kind of a, a relaxed week. Hasn't actually been super busy in here this week, unfortunately. So yeah, but uh, b business is starting to come back a little bit, which is always good to hear in the shop. Um, all right. Well, let's go right on to our beer of the week. Bum bum bum. Beer of the week. Yeah. Woo. You're welcome it. for that jingle. So, um, yeah, so we have a Belgian quad on tap right now. And, Super uh, delicious. Very unique beer. Very, in fact, I think the kind of variation that we did on it is even a little bit more unique because of the hops. Um, but, uh, yeah, so that falls into uh, BJCP category 26D, um, and that is a Belgian dark strong. Um, and pre-2015 guidelines, I believe it was actually a separate category between Belgian Strong and uh, Quad. Uh, but post-2015, the most recent up-to-date uh, BJCP category has it listed under the Belgian Dark Strong category. Yep. So by nature, these are very big beers. These are going to be anywhere from 10 to uh, – or no, sorry, 8 to 12 percent alcohol. I believe ours actually falls on the even high end of that. It's Is it 12? We're popping right at 12 percent. Yeah, I was going to say it's right at 12 um, so these, these are very big beers. These are boozy beers. Um, and really what uh, makes these beers what they are is um, the crazy, crazy uh, malt profile in, in the sense of you are getting big aromatics and flavors of, of dark fruit, of cherry. Um, and that's coming from the yeast and in our case, actually quite a bit from the hops as well. Um, and then uh, and a lot of that's built off of an overall sort of big boozy profile. And so um, one, of the, one of the points that the BJCP mentions on this style is that you will have a certain alcohol presence. And this isn't the alcohol presence when you think of like cheap booze. It's not fusils that should be in there. It's also um, not the kind of alcohol presence where you, you imagine like your Christmas stocking and stuff to those little mini shooters. <laughs> yeah. You um, so this is definitely more of, of a warming sensation that will build off of the natural notes that the My yeast are great. <laughs> that the yeast will throw off. <laughs> and uh, and yeah, so notes of uh, typically dominated by um, plum and raisin. Yeah, there and you go. Ch yeah, dark cherry, cherry yep. uh, even some like over ripened yep. stone fruit notes it, can come through. And in our case, tangerine even. Tangerine. Uh, that's a that's a precursor to the hop, by the yeah. way. Yeah. Or pre, not precursor. I don't know what I'm talking I've about. I've been trying to pull up my BJCP app. Are you? Uh, <laughs> are we on to malt? What are we talking about right now? Uh, yeah. So let's just uh, go on to malt. So anyway, yeah, big boozy beer. Um, but they finish on the drier side for being that high. That's actually typical of most Belgian styles. Um, so that is one thing to keep in mind and note on if you want to brew this style at home. Yeah. Um, so the malt I chose is actually a pretty typical malt for these beers because um, they are going to be darker in color. Typically, um, Belgian quads, Belgian strong ales are going to be in that sort of amber range. Um, with that said, they can vary quite a bit from sort of a deep golden heel all the way to, you know, pretty dark, almost opaque. Uh, but uh, Special B is always a good place to start. And why is that, Peter? Uh, because it's very, very special. Uh, no, it sits in that uh, that 130 Lava Bond range. I've seen Special B is as dark as 180. Uh, the one that we carry is Dingeman Special B. Uh, Dingeman Special B is a uh, double roasted crystal, basically, which means it's not going to have a ton of just straight caramel sweetness. It's going to have a little bit much sure Maillard reaction uh, that's going on with the roasting process. And that gives you those nice raisiny notes in the malt itself. So it'll have that intense carameliness, but then it'll also have like really nice notes of dark toffee and, uh, and like that raisin. And like I said, maybe some overripe stone fruit notes from the malt as well yeah so other than adding special b uh usually you're gonna have a fairly simple grain bill actually um generally just one or two specialty malts as well as some belgian candy sugar just like you should in any belgian beer just to balance out that sweetness um, and dry the beer out so you know be it you know a simple sugar or 
um, being it a darker candy sugar yeah, as well. Candy sugar is obviously the typical, but candy sugar can get really expensive. So if you don't want to be spending, you know, twelve dollars on candy sugar for your beer, <laughs> completely understandable. Just throw uh, some table sugar. In yeah, there. table sugar it. works pretty <laughs> dang good as well. Or if you got some like old, uh, old honey that's starting to get over solidified in your, yeah. uh, in your pantry somewhere that might be a good use for it as well yeah. and really the the beauty of special b especially in a beer like this is that um those dark fruit notes like peter mentioned are really just going to build on the character that that yeast is going to provide during that high alcohol fermentation yeah uh, and yeah. Uh, all of this will kind of melds together beautifully the longer you can let these things age which we'll be talking about a little bit when we go into our hop that we're using uh which is mandarina bavaria so this is actually a very atypical hop for um, the style, but I did kind of go and take a peek at the brew log. And when Tim threw this beer together, he definitely had this. It was amongst other ones, but um, the Mandarina kind of stuck out to me because uh, it is known for uh, being a sort of a, a nice sort of hybridized hop of, that produces uh, very distinctive tangerine notes um, and sort of a sweet citrusy quality, um, at least when it's young, without being um, too much of like a grapefruit profile that you're going to get from a lot of these big New World hops. Yeah, another thing that, so first of all, the, the Mandarina Bavaria is a Cascade daughter. It's done with, uh, with a, the famous German breeding program over there, but they took some good old American Cascades and turned them German. One thing yep. that this did is it lowered the total overall oil compared to what you would get in a Cascade, uh, which is part of what pops those tangerine notes when you use this as a fresh hop. Um, especially in anything like if you're doing a wheat beer, it's a fantastic wheat beer base, uh, light, colches, blondes, if anything you want that extra pop from. But as this beer ages, a lot of the, those low oil hops, uh, I'm thinking uh, Nelson Sauvin kind of goes into the same category, um, Whole Melon, Howertau Blanc kind of all fall in the same category, but they start to develop this beautiful white wine note when they age out. Yeah, so definitely. Um, yeah, but uh, the, the one thing I really like about what the Mandarina does is it builds off of those dark fruit uh, characters by adding some slightly lighter stuff, that tangerine note, um, it actually to me, like on the on the aroma at least, it almost smells like um, like or like bitters. Yeah. Uh, like when you're adding bitters to you know alcohol with Manhattan or whatever. Um, so it's got that aroma, and, but it's not overwhelming. Right. Um, because it was blended with some other hops, um, but it just adds another depth of complexity and adds just a little bit of uniqueness to the style without taking away from. Um, the natural ester profile from the yeast and a little bit of those phenols as well. And it's good that you mentioned the bitters because the one thing that bitters are designed to do in co cocktails is actually help mask and blend in with the flavor of the fact that they are very, very boozy. They're al alcoholic, which goes perfectly with something like a 12% beer because obviously you're going to get some booziness off of that guy. Yep. So, so yeah, so that is Mandarina Bavaria for you. Um, yeah, just kind of a little bit of a different hop, but I think it works really well. And like Peter mentioned, uh, that um, Huel Melon might also be a fun one or even like something like Nelson Savon. Um, but, uh, but at the same time, you are going to be restrained on these for, a, say, a five-gallon batch. Um, I probably would try to keep your total like hop bill um, at least under two or three ounces. Even yeah. three might be excessive. Three would probably be on my high end. Yeah, exactly. Um, typically, um, a quad is not about the hops, especially when you know we're talking about beers that are probably designed um, realistically to age for six months or even more um, before being consumed. So, um, uh, well, let's jump onto the yeast. The yeast that we chose is another imperial yeast because we like to go with imperial a lot uh, and that is monastic yeah so monastic really i i just kind of pulled that yeast out just because i know that it has a nice balance profile it's going to produce some phenols um and also produce those dark fruit notes that we're going for uh, but mostly it's it's a good um it's it, it'll finish out a beer especially a big beer like this very consistently um, time and time again and that's really why i chose this yeast strain um, otherwise i actually saw somebody mentioned in the comments a little bit earlier um, triple double that they oh, yeah. they uh, they use that to finish out a beer and it they did a quad that finished out at 007 um, which that would actually be another fantastic strain also the year that i graduated high school so <laughs> So, yes, that, <laughs> that means everything. Um, uh, no, but Triple Double is actually uh, the yeast that we used in the Belgian Imperial IPA that we have on right now uh, and also tastes fantastic. It's absolutely yeah. a strong – I was going to say it's a workhorse, but Imperial also makes a yeast uh, called Yeah, workhorse. workhorse would actually also be a good one. Yeah, I think the Triple Double is going to give you a little bit more of a fruitier profile. Um, so that might actually build up on the hops a little bit more. So if you're using that to try to kind of stay within that category, you might actually want to drop your hop bill down a little bit if you're using something like Triple Double, uh, whereas the Monastic is actually going to be a little bit more balanced with some spicy phenols. That should also be in there. So, yeah. 
Um, all right, well, I think that sums up our beer of the week. If you enjoyed our beer of the week, give this video a like right now. Bam, and come and uh, taste our, our quad on tap. It's yeah. I think we only got like one half barrel left, so no it's No matter going where fast. you are on this planet, go, come and taste the quad. Come oh, we also have, uh, we do have one uh, keg of that aging on Brett too, so we'll see what happens with that. That should be a fun little experiment for us. Oh yeah, I gotta call Tim about that too. Yeah, and it's, yeah it's in a <laughs> BET keg, so. Yeah, they're in BET sure kegs, and I, just, and I just like pushed on them like, ooh, <laughs> those are at like 30 PSI right now. Nice and taut, hey, they can <laughs> handle it. They're, uh, they're, they're quality. PET kegs. Well, they can handle 30, but what happens in another month when... Shh, nobody has to know. <laughs> All right, let's move on to the discussion topics. Uh, discussion topic number one and kind of the big headline of this video is about Untapped. Untapped is a uh, common social drinking app that I would say a lot of people that are in the beer industry, uh, they use, they look at regularly. Um, however, on our side where we interact with not only a lot of customers, but a lot of people that are beer owners, bar owners, brewery owners, people like that, uh, we get very, very mixed results for how people think of it. Because uh, a lot of people will be like, oh my God, someone just gave me a one star on Untapped and I, it, they checked it in in Chicago where we've never been or had any beer. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, so one tapped is it's it or untapped. One one, no, one tapped. Uh, un, <laughs> untapped is it's it's a double edged sword to the brewing industry. Um, the the reality of it is is yes, it's kind of a cool thing because it gets more people that are into beer wanting to try more beers. It does allow people to share their beer and their brewing, or not their brewing experience, but yeah. their, uh, share the beers that they've drank with their friends uh, and hopefully introduce new beers to new yeah. people through that. It's a great way of getting people more involved with their beer. However, <laughs> however, <laughs> that's that's about where, where it ends right there. Um, and actually, this whole kind of topic is spawned because I came across one of our beers on Untapped, and, uh, and it just seemed to have random reviews across the board no descriptions of the beer. Uh, in fact, one of them, one of them the, did have a description like, ah, beer was fantastic. It was like three and a half stars or yeah. something like that. And it's like, well, if it was fantastic, why is it three and a half stars? <laughs> yeah. Best beer I've ever had, two <laughs> stars. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, just kind of went down this rabbit hole of, of okay, like there's, no, like there's no correlation there like, um, between what people are rating, um, the edu how educated people are, that are rating these beers um, and then whether or not really there's any kind of a bias uh, in those in those uh, reviews and you know whether they're giving a certain brewery a higher review just because they think the brewery is cool um, and it turns uh, out there definitely is so let's start before we go too far into all, all that let's start with what actually satisfies uh, um, or, or what uh, we need to ask in terms of is untapped good in the beer industry in general or is it good for the beer industry is it good for the beer culture uh, and that's asking does it satisfy any of the qualities that promote beer slash positive drinking culture uh, to me that means either does it make drinking more fun does it make people want to go out and drink more and enjoy the beer culture a little bit more uh, and or does it uh, adequately educate or promote people finding good beers um, so those are the questions that we're going to kind of seek to answer through going and uh, talking about like bias reviews and things like that. So let's jump into uh, the bias that people have when it comes to reviews. Yeah, so what I noticed immediately um, is after I was on there, I, I saw one of the tabs that was was uh, top rated beers, right? Um, and so I was like, oh, well, I, that's interesting. I'm interesting, interested to see what are the best beers in America, right? Because that's mm -hmm. what something like this should represent, the best beers in America. However... <laughs> I will, uh, I will, I will try to uh, set a challenge out to anyone that is watching right now. Go on the top rated beers, and in the top 100 rated beers, try to find a pilsner, because in my opinion, um, some of the best produced beers are actually pilsners, um, and yet you will not find a single one in there. In fact, the what I found was the first two pages of top rated beers were all dark beers and they were all special release beers, um, which kind of leads to a whole nother rabbit hole of basically marketing hype. And if somebody is telling you, hey, look, this is a really expensive beer, this is a special release, um, somebody already goes in with the mindset of saying, oh my God, this beer is gonna be so amazing. So you sort of get this um, bandwagony effect of, of, yes, I got to drink this beer, therefore this beer must be amazing, right? Yeah. 
Uh, and a lot of, so a lot of times what Untapped does, and I think this kind of goes into the culture that Untapped built and then why it's bad that people build their mindset of craft beer around the culture that Untapped has built. And I also want to mention this, this is not to dock Untapped at all as an app, as a platform. I think they are doing things just fine. Although there is one thing that I think we can probably talk about a little bit later that they could do better. Um, but this isn't against Untapped. It's just a kind of happenstance by the culture that has come of that being a social app slash a beer rating app at the same time. Um, but uh, the culture that is built is those big hype beers are the ones that are going to be uh, built at the top because the number of people that are buying those are fewer and they are consistently rating them higher because they're the people that are willing to buy it. And so it's kind of this cyclical you know, problem, yep. whereas beers that are more uh, mass consumed get in the hands of more people, uh, obviously have a wider variance of people who are rating those beers. Yeah. Um, and then uh, kind of as a side note, for one, cheers, homebrew for life. He's uh, he's. Yeah, cheers, Umber for I've Tapping in, in the comments. Oh, okay, we're just leaving you hanging. That's cool, too. Well, yeah, well, you were cheersing him, and so I was like, <laughs> yeah. I don't know why you're cheersing me when you say cheers, um, Umber for Life. But, uh, um, sorry, I can't really pronounce your username. Um, but uh, so I'm just going to call you Salad. Uh, is uh, they're wondering Salad Daffy Is uh, <laughs> if uh, you should rate a beer by its style or by your personal preference or by a mix of both. Um, and ultimately, I kind of like to go along the lines of rate a beer by its style first, because on a commercial situation, um, if you're putting a beer out and you're calling it something that it's not, that's just misrepresentation and misguidance for somebody that's drinking a beer. Because if somebody isn't familiar with that style, then they're going to think that if a beer is misrepresenting a style, that it's actually not rep mi not misrepresenting the style. Um, and then just get everybody confused as a result. Um, but if you are familiar with the style, say it's, you know, a hazy IPA and you've had 20 hazy IPAs this summer alone, um, you're probably pretty familiar with the style and you kind of know which ones are going to be better, which ones aren't. So at that point, you know, I definitely would say yes. If you get familiar with it, use your pers personal preference to say, hey, look, this one was much better because... Um, but make sure that you um, write that and, and let people know. Yeah, and uh, people that uh, are on, a lot of the people that get on Untapped, uh, as uh, Fraz the Penguin just mentioned, uh, a lot of people that get on tap have a different internal rating system. So what they may rate a beer as, um, like four or five, four stars, or uh, might be a pretty good rating to somebody. Like I know a lot of people who won't rate really great beers above a four because they save that five for like the perfect beer ever, right? Yeah. Exactly. And, and then you got other people that rate places like they rate uh, or rate beers like a lot of people rate uh, places where if they got a good personal connection with the staff there, um, they're going to give that place a five because they had a good experience and they don't see any reason to give it anything less than a five. And so you got a lot of people trying to be these uh, these overcritical internal judges, no matter what their range of tasting preference is, um, which gives you a lot of skewed data when it comes into actually using untapped as a rating system. The problem for that, that isn't a problem in and of itself, but the problem comes back when the owners see that and then they don't know how to react or what to do when they're seeing these this mixed array of ratings. Is that something yeah. that you should take as a personal criticism and try to improve? Is that something that um, you know, is a, is a 3.75 going to be a standard that you need to judge by, or are you like us and just don't even have untapped at all and don't care? So, yeah. And then the next thing I want to talk about is, is an overall lack of, you know, peer revision. Uh, that's, you know, people bash Wikipedia all the time for things, but, but the reality is that if you say something that is false, so say you judge a beer and you're like, and it's a, you know, the beer is literally like a, a black IPA and somebody's like worst Pilsner I've ever had in my life seen it uh, happen <laughs> yeah so uh, and and that goes on untapped if that was on Wikipedia that would pretty much immediately be removed because you'd have 50 people calling him out saying dude that wasn't a Pilsner like <laughs> what are you what are you talking about yeah um, so you know that is one thing that I think that untapped could be doing a better job is is getting basically some kind of moderators out there some kind of peer revision um, even a tab to just let other people like chime in and respond to another person's review uh, might actually help out a lot there. Yeah, and I think there, there are a lot of other apps that are like that, that even uh, um, they uh, will raise like heavy users of their apps up to the ability to do some level of moderation in their area. Uh, you see this with uh, a lot of like Google apps. You see this with Pokemon Go. You see this with you know a lot of like gaming apps that are locally uh, derived or they use location at all. Uh, 
Uh, I would like to see Strava do this, just an idea if Strava ends up, ever ends up watching this. Uh, but having some sort of like local moderators with heavy users, uh, or like how Google has the, what's it, what's it called, Google's local guides or whatever? Yeah, the local guides, yeah. If so. you can have people that have a little, a little extra power to say, hey, maybe flag this. Yeah, this person basically has more credibility. Exactly, yeah. and, like, and they can flag certain beers, like if uh, one of our beers, for example, is checked in in Chicago or Florida or something where our beer has never been, then there should be some level of moderation where we can say that's not a valid that's not a valid judgment that's yeah. not a valid review I, even though it's a review on like uh, hey this uh this beer yeah. tasted sour this goza tasted sour i don't like sours one star one star yeah i don't which i've seen that plenty of times too yeah. that beer was sour what's wrong with it um so yeah uh and then the last thing i kind of want to talk about actually comes full circle back to um where you know somebody was asking to put like a qr location um, which you should be able to check in where your location's at. Um, but uh, yeah. but also it comes back to where you're getting the beer from, especially, luckily this hasn't been much of an issue for us, um, but coming kind of full circle back to like the hazy situation um, is is that when those are released, a lot of times they're released um, in, in specialty cans that are limited as well. Uh, so if I'm a brewer and I release out cans, say you can only get two cases at a time, right? Yeah. Uh, of these hazies because they're designed to be drank within a month of me sending them out to the f to the distributor, and yet somebody checks in with a batch of beer that I released three months ago with a bad review, saying, "Wow, this beer tastes super oxidized." Uh, it's it's one of those things where it actually comes down to the end retailer to to say, "Hey." why why are you still having this beer on the shelf or maybe even the final consumer yeah. that bought the beer two months ago threw it in their fridge and now they're drinking old oxidized ipa uh so it's you know it's just it, i think ultimately the the solution to to making everything better and and making untapped as a platform um, more involved um, and more useful for both both brewers and consumers is just getting everybody on a higher level of education about beer in general. Or making it a little bit more tough to go through with a full-on review. That way you don't have people that are mass, or they're, they're the more social drinkers uh, that are trying to be those beer critics that are mid-level palates. They don't really have a good palate for beer, um, but they're putting themselves into that quote-unquote expert knowledge. Um, so I, I get that Untapped is about drinking socially, but overall, if it's forcing people to try to be critical about every beer that they are doing, rather than just sharing the beer that they're drinking and having personal reviews of the people that are connecting, and then it's not really creating that at atmosphere of getting people to try and drink more beers because the actual social connection between people on Untapped isn't nearly as great as the connection between people and other beers reviews. Uh, and that's the big hiccup when it comes to Untapped. That's why we don't think it necessarily does a good job in promoting beer or beer culture and why it might actually be bad for beer business because rather than making it a platform where it's about connecting with other people and about sharing your experiences and beers with other people, it's more about rating the number of beers you get badges for the number of beers that you drink and rate and about Which is smart but <laughs> it is smart <laughs> smart and, and, and about uh and about looking t at beers or beer places for reviews uh rather than about sharing a culture and that's why we think it generally speaking gets a lot of other businesses uh now uh, it gets them angry at it on taps because they yeah. see people reviewing their beers for bad reasons. Uh, I know a lot of breweries that follow on tap religiously and they just get so socially anxious when it comes to their reviews. I think it's probably better if you're another business to be like us and just don't use it or don't look at the ratings at least. All right. Well, now that we are all in a sour state of mind, you see what I see that transition there? <laughs> Play on words. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's it for untapped. Um, we're going to leave it at that. Uh, we'll probably, you know, talk a little bit about it at the end of the uh, show here. But uh, um, we let's transition into um, sour beers, um, especially because we have been throwing more and more sour beers on tap here. And as a result, it's actually been somewhat surprising. We've actually had more and more people. Well, I guess it, sh in. it shouldn't be surprising, but yeah, coming but in for our sours. So we're getting known for sours a little bit here. And so we've kind of been playing around with the range of sours that you can do. Now, we've done everything from super, super aggressive Flanders red style sours to very, very barely tipping the surface. Uh, what we almost just call a tart beer. Basically, it's a regular beer with a sour kick to it and oftentimes some other flavoring. So we wanted to talk about the spectrum that you can get in sours and then break down where all those sournesses come from. But before we do that, I want everyone that's tuned in to uh, hit that little thumbs up button because I there's see a lot of you out there. Of you. And there's only 20 of you. 
we can see every single one of you one of you right now so do it uh, yeah so uh we actually were joking about uh the spectrum of sour beer and uh you know a lot of people think of sours really in two different ways you have kettle sours um that aren't sour uh that aren't sour in their mind but can actually be really sour yeah. um and then you also have uh, the true sours, things like you know Flanders Reds and Ode Bruins, that are gonna that are gonna melt your face and give you butt pucker syndrome. But yeah, uh, yes. <laughs> but yeah, so we're actually we're gonna make a T-shirt. Don't worry about it. It's gonna have a range uh, just in emojis that rates the sour range. Um, so yeah, it'll it be goes, super cool. You guys will love it. Yeah. What did I, what did I say the range went to? I made a note on this about it actually. Oh, from tart to face melt. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but uh, the reality is is that you can do something as simple as adding say 12 ounces of acid malt um, which is just going to be on the high end uh, of a beer uh, to turn that beer into a well essentially a sour yeah. um, because at that point um, generally 12 ounces to a pound will cross that that threshold of of lactic acid um, on the, on your palate and you will actually start to get hints of ever so slight tartness um, generally this will just kind of change the way the hops come through at least what we've talked about in the past here. Or if you've got any slight fruit, um, sometimes that fruit will get popped. It'll get a little yeah, bit Yeah, it'll tarty. just pop that fruit a little bit, kind of give you those like really, really traditional citrusy notes. Um, so it can be as simple as that. Or even uh, if you make, if you were to make a Berliner Weiss or a Goza in the historical traditional way, a lot of times those beers aren't actually as sour as what you can get with pretty much any Goza or Berliner Weiss that you can buy in the store these days. And the reason being, those beers were often co-pitched, meaning they had multiple uh, yeast slash lactic acid producing bacteria that went into them at the same time. And because of competition, uh, the, the lactic acid producing bacteria didn't quite make it as far as the yeast would, or, or if they would have, if you have done like a kettle sour where you give your lactobacillus two days to make the sourness before you pitch your yeast. Yeah. Uh, so the other thing to consider is that even true sours, you know, things like uh, your Ode Bruins. I mean, obviously, Flanders by style is going to be very, very sour. Um, but even an American sour ale doesn't have to melt your face. It, it really depends on the yeast culture that you're working with. Um, if there's like a lot of Britannomyces in there, for instance, um, that's going to kind of scrub out any oxygen uh, that might actually the oxygen shouldn't matter forget what I said there. Oh, um, well, it does because of how Britannomyces oh, yes. ferments in the presence of oxygen and, and acetic acid. Yeah, I was going to say acetobacter. Yeah. That's where I was going with that. I was thinking lactic, but... Yeah, um, well, but yeah, lactic, lactobacillus would be underperforming in the presence of oxygen. Most lactobacillus depends on the strain, but... But yeah, so if you have a lot of other yeast, the bottom line in there, um, the beer is going to be less sour or it's going to take a lot longer to actually become intensely sour, which might be a good thing depending on what you're going for it i've i've actually had a handful of american sours that are pleasantly sour but not nearly to the level of like of like that big acetic punch that you get from a flanders right have we talked about gravities yet so we have not talked about gravities yet so are we ready to talk about gravities we can talk about gravities so when it comes to sourness and how you perceive sourness one thing that we won't touch on too much but just to keep in mind is basically how that sourness will perceive depending on your final gravity so if your beer is bone dry like any sort of brute beer or a lot of like saison style beers if you have like a killer saison yeast in there uh, will be then that sourness will punch forward a lot stronger than if your beer finish is sweet uh, and that's why a lot of times people these days are adding lactose to a lot of their sours because that sweetness comes back to balance out the tartness and you end up with a more balanced profile so yeah. they perceive less sour yeah you can actually drop the ph on a uh, like a on a sour beer to let's say like probably like three eight or something like that you can actually get it like a nice little level of tartness and uh and then, but back sweeten it with lactose and you end up with something that tastes like strawberry shortcake, so. Yeah, whereas um, if you get to like three, two, then it's gonna be a little bit more of that face pucker. Mm. And you know, at that point, I would say some sort of back sweetening, or I mean, some people get their sours to like two, eight before they- One of these days we things. should try to get a beer down below, below two. <laughs> I think that would start to be burning. <laughs> I, might, I might burn your throat. For people who don't was, know pH, by the way, every, yeah, every, it's one log pH, yeah, every one pH is 10 times as sour as the pH above it. So I don't think we could get it down below to you. <laughs> Not without just adding a ton of actual acid to it. Uh, I'm I think that might be dangerous. That would yeah. be like stomach lining. I know. I'm pretty sure it's possible to get below three, though. I'm oh, pretty for sure. sure no, there's yeah, been yeah, some I've below see, three. I've seen plenty of people get there. So two eight. Two eight's pretty sour. Yeah, two, eight, two eight's like classic, like, woo, that is sour. 
Speaking of where sourness comes from, let's talk about the different kinds of acid because they do have different flavor thresholds and they do perceive differently. Uh, acids like lactic acid is the, well, lactic acid is the common sweet acid. That's why we use lactic acid in beers is because it doesn't come across as aggressive or harsh as other acids. Uh, and that's why it tastes great in beer. But you also have balancing acids that can be soft like citric and ascorbic. Citric's underused in my opinion. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Uh, uh, and then you have the, the, the more aggressive ad, uh, acids. Uh, uh, acetic acid is the most aggressive and pungent of all the acids, uh, but a lot of malic and tartaric acid say. can also be really aggressive too. Malic is classic uh, warheads, if you think of warheads. And tartaric, I don't have a good example for. Sweet. It's what you make meringue out of. Uh, thank you so much, Oliver. He just super chatted us. He uh, just basically gave us a comment. So. Oh, I appreciate <laughs> it. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for that. And uh, yeah, well, so let's go on. So yeah, lactic um, is going to be the most common one too. In fact, lactic is, is one of our go-tos for, uh, for general kettle souring. Um, it's going to be the primary, primary acid that we're getting when we're using our acidulated malt. Um, but also we have just concentrated lactic acid that a lot of times we'll just dose some beers with. That's the easiest way to make a regular beer sour. And we've been playing around with that a lot more lately. Uh, we're also going to be coming out with a video on how to sour three different ways. And so one of those ways will actually just be adding lactic acid and a, an acid blend to a beer. Um, so keep an eye out for that. Uh, but yeah, lactic acid is the easiest way to turn a regular beer into a kettle sour. Yep. So the next one is citric acid, uh, which citric acid will do some fun things. It will, I mean, just like it says, it'll kind of pop through those grapefruity notes of a beer. Yep. Um, but it does have a fairly low flavor threshold. So I really recommend um, trying to be restrained with that. If it's their first time using it, um, definitely shoot for the low end because you can overdo this pretty easily. And it'll kind of mess with the flavor of your beer a little bit. Yes, uh, yeah, it starts to get, I've had some intensely over aggressively citric acided beers yeah. and they actually still taste like a good sour. It's yeah. I mean, it's just like uh, biting into an orange. That's what citric acid is. Uh, but yeah, they can get very aggressive if they're in the wrong place. Um, the one that I had, the first one that I ever had, somebody tried to dose, um, dose an entire mash to proper mash pH with just citric acid in a very, very alkaline, uh, with very alkaline water. And he did all the calculations and everything like that, but he didn't account for the fact that citric acid is a weak acid and has a much lower flavor threshold than something like a lactic acid. And so it ended up being very citric acidy and it tasted okay. Yeah. I actually, I mean, y if you know what you're doing, I remember we, we played around with it, actually adding a lot of it to a very, very light beer. It was some kind of like American lager, or, yeah. you know, cerveza kind of style. Turned into a mojito beer. And we actually, yeah, I messed around with it poured in a bunch of citric acid, poured in a little mojito flavoring, and basically uh, turned it into a mojito beer. So, you know, if, if you uh, if you got some some crazy ideas out there, you can definitely mess with some light beers with it. Beer is greater than crystal meth. Barely, but I agree. <laughs> Jesus. All right. Uh, so uh, next is going to be ascorbic acid. This is one that we uh, should, should have a, be used in most mashes. This is just going to help with overall oxidization and shelf stability it does actually have a flavor too but it's more difficult than citric to get to the flavor threshold yeah really uh, high flavor threshold on sit or on ascorbic acid yeah that said when you have ascorbic acid and citric acid together in a beer oftentimes it does help pronounce those kind of citrusy notes from them uh and ascorbic acid obviously we use that in every single beer below its flavor threshold just as an antioxidant so it's a very powerful antioxidant and will help your beer stay fresh that's why we use it in hazy ipas um, Oliver, the, so Oliver's asking about, uh, Flemish reds. Are, is that, is that different from, um, I think that's like a Flanders. Oh, it takes so long. There is not a shortcut for that. It is going to be a mixed culture. Uh, and the number one way to brew a Flemish red is going to be, uh, with some sort of oak stave. If you're in a carboy, uh, the oak stave is going to be basically what's going to be in the bung. Um, and that's going to give you that low dose, uh, that low, slow rate of oxygen because it will uh, act as a, as a medium, basically, where uh, the oxygen uh, will go through the stave and eventually get into the inside of your carboy and very, very slowly allow acetobacter to work at the same time as uh, the rest of your culture. I think the easiest way to do it. Okay, yeah. Flanders, that is the same thing. Yeah. I was just making sure. The um, easiest way to do it is going to be uh, to use a mixed culture. We like to use the Rosa Lair blend. Um, and a lot of times what we'll do is we'll do consecutive beers with that same oak stave. And so if you have like a Saison after that, you can unplug the uh, oak stave bung yeah. situation from your uh, previous batch and then throw that into your next into a Saison and allow that to age out. Yeah, uh, that's that's kind of I think the, the same route I would take is 
is allowing a little bit more oxygen than you otherwise would try to um, just to sort of speed up that acidification process. Um, but also, if you happen to have a beer that's already pretty tart and already mature, um, I would definitely try to do some kind of a blend with that to sort of help inoculate um, the, the next beer that you're trying to speed up. So um, say if you're doing five gallons, um, pull off about 20% of a nice mature beer that's already sour, already tart, and where you want it to be. Throw it in the new beer after it goes through maybe a month primary. Um, and then you're kind of putting all those good bugs that are going to help sour that beer nice and quickly into that new beer. You're inoculating it um, and then kind of doing what Peter said with putting in some kind of a, an oak stave or something that's going to allow in a little bit of oxygen. So, As for a true shortcut, if you wanted to be very bold and brazen, you could take something like a scotch ale uh, and you could try playing with acids. Uh, it's going to have... Uh, if you can, but that would be very, very difficult because of how aggressive one of the key acids, which is vinegar, is. Um, but I have seen, seen it done with apple cider vinegar uh, and lactic acid and acetic acid. What I would do is I would get to the right tartness with just the lactic acid first, and then I would slowly and very smallly dose with the apple cider vinegar until you barely got that flavor. Um, that would be the kind of cheater's way. Yes. But uh, I, don't, I don't know how that will that work. Also, we're going to be called out for a cooking with beer episode in our sour milkshake. <laughs> what do you think you guys will go with? Hmm. We're going to go with lobster. Lobster? Oh, God. No lobster. Live lobster. Uh, maybe oysters, though. Maybe oysters later this summer. Ooh, yeah, that'd be fun. Um, but, uh, yeah, so speaking uh, of, yeah. of Flanders, um, one thing to note for those of you that aren't familiar with the style um, and kind of finishing up our different types of acids um, is that Flanders Reds will actually have, um, or Flemish Reds, either one, um, same style. They're going to have a lot of acetic acid in that. Acetic acid is caused by a bacteria that actually likes that oxygen. And that's why we keep saying get a little bit of oxygen in there, kind of let that do its thing because it's going to promote the acetic acid. Um, and you might even get some malic acid formation in there as well, um, which is going to give you that really, really intense back of the throat kind of a punch. Uh, so that's that's uh, what Flanders are all about, and that pretty much is all of our acid types of acids and how they're going to affect the tartness and or face melt quality of a beer. Yeah, but super delicious. Uh, yeah, and do it. Yeah. Try it. Uh, Oliver, if you end up doing that at home, please share your experience with us. We'd love to find out. Even if you do want to try uh, micro dosing, just like a bottle of a, mm. of a scotch ale and seeing if you can get that right balance. That'd be a fun experiment, and I'd love to see it work. <laughs> Lobster Rolonos. It's definitely uh, happening. All right. Uh, all right, so let's finally uh, turn this all thing out by finding balance in your sours uh, with fruit, which we kind of talked about a little bit with uh, the final gravities. Um, fruit will do something similar if you want sweetness off of them, but obviously there's some other qualities from fruit that you'll want to go for. Yeah, so the fruits, some fruit will have actually a lot of acidity in it, but blending that into a sour later in the process um, and then actually um, even maybe killing the yeast in some cases so you maintain the sweetness of the fruit, you maintain those natural sugars in there, uh, is actually a really great way to help balance out um, the, the acidity and the natural tartness of the beer itself. Um, sours just by nature. Um, you know, I'm thinking about things like raspberries, things like strawberries. Um, try what other fruit is, is naturally tart? Um, but basically using it to just build up a fruit beer into something that instead of being, you know, either dry or awkward or just sickly sweet um, has a really nice balance to it and overall makes it a more complex um, and easy drinking beer. And there's nothing wrong with a purple beer, by the way. I know but a lot of people purple are beers like, are gorgeous. They are gorgeous. Yeah. And a lot of people are like, uh, you know, those classic and we'd love a good Pilsner. We love a classic, yeah. good, clear looking beer. But we also love you know purple beers yeah raspberry beers are some of the prettiest beers i've ever seen oh yeah for sure and uh well, we get a lot of like huckleberry in this area and so when a huckleberry beer comes out crystal clear i'm usually like eh, like we have one that's actually clear right now but uh, i usually i want that purple yep so um so yeah so that is fruits um let's go ahead and open this up to um, general questioning as we kind of finish out the fruit um but yeah because the fruit you do want to balance it with the malt profile um, but also balance it with the hops. Um, I think if you use a very, very selective dry hop in a sour, which is also another thing to note, most sour beers um, will generally have very little hops in the boil or no hops at all, and all those hops will go on back end to help complement whatever flavor profile you're trying to achieve. Also, dry hopping will raise the pH. Fun fact. Um, yes, it does do that as well. 
um, which increases bitterness, right? Decreases bitterness. Decrease. Makes it softer. I thought so, it increases it. No. Oh, Ra- okay. Raises the pH. It Perce- yeah. Perceive bitterness anyway. Yeah. I mean, it adds to the flavor. It <laughs> makes a more flavorful <laughs> compound, but it does. A, it can soften. So if you have a sour that's slightly overly tart for your taste, uh, for your liking, a dry hop will soften that a little bit and add some fruity components that go with it. Um, but you can also, when, you talk, when we're talking about fruit a little bit, another thing to talk about is whether or not you want that fruit to fully ferment out or whether you want the sweetness from your fruit because there's two different methods to do that. And personally, I like to do it both ways depending on the beer. Uh, if it's a Saison base or something that I want nice and bright like that, obviously I'll throw it late stage in the fermentation and make sure that fruit gets dried out and you just get some color and some reminiscent notes. Um, but there's also plenty of kettle soured beers that I've had completely finished out, made sure I crashed them out, and then threw the fruit cold into the bright tank so that that sweetness maintained in the beer and uh, obviously it's sent and into kegging as well. Yeah, or this would actually be another great example of uh, trying to use that monk fruit extract like I think we talked about a while ago. Yeah, and to make sure um, that you got sweetness in to balance out all the... Yep, monk fruit extract for those of you out there that are not in the know-how is a non-fermentable sugar uh, that we have played with in two or three different beers now and had great results every time from. It adds a very, very subtle sweetness. Um, and most, mostly a uh, fuller mouthfeel to the beer. Eight out of ten so. would repeat. Definitely so. Um, and, yeah, somebody's saying add some gooseberries. Heck, yeah. Gooseberries, would, I'm sure, would make a fantastic sour. I cannot get a hold of any gooseberries, though. So. I think that was uh, that was uh, to when you were asking what fruits are still tart. Oh, yeah. Goose- oh, yeah. Gooseberries are, are totally tart. You made it through fru- fru- two fruits, and you were like, what other fruits are tart? <laughs> hey, those are, well, those are the ones that, like, I know, like, if you put them in beer— the beer is basically going to taste sour yeah, just it'll from up adding just those from berries. Fruit, yeah, because yeah, they're are really so common. pungent. Um, yeah, blackberries you'd think would be, but they're not. Um, that's that's one of those things that's like it's really weird. So it's not necessarily how the base fruit, fruit taste is going to be the way that it comes out in the beer. And, yes, oranges and grapefruits are obviously tart as well. Um, okay. Come on. All right. That's <laughs> – I was thinking of berries. Come on, people. Come on, people. <laughs> but you said fruit. Uh, <laughs> All Thank right. you for making fun of Logan on that one, guys. I appreciate <laughs> it. Uh, I don't get to eat a lot of fruit or anything for that matter. Uh, cranberry. True. Oh, yeah. Cran- cranberries we need to definitely put in a beer. Cranberries are fun. Yes. And those actually grow, like, well, close to here. Just Also, lemonade. Us. I mean, it is shandy season. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I guess lemons are tart. All right. <laughs> we just need to stop making fun of me on this. I'm feeling dumber by the second. Agree to disagree. Um, I'm scrolling up to see if we uh, missed any <laughs> questions right now. Uh, rose hips. We actually put rose hips in a beer. Rose hips have a nice, Didn't like, we? raisin. Yeah, we've done it a couple yeah. times. They have a nice, like, raisiny kind of quality. Uh, I don't get a ton of bitterness off them, but. Yeah, they're pretty subtle, but they also add a fantastic color, too. So, um, blackberries add bitterness. Ooh, oh, seed talk- buckthorn. Interesting. When we were talking about uh, untapped, someone added, uh, added uh, it'd be nice if they could add up votes and down votes to reviews like on reddit that'd be one way to moderate oh the, uh, that would be a really simple way to do it too yeah moderate yeah. the damn um somebody said cranberries are hard to ferment i actually don't know about that um but sea buckthorn i would have if my dog did not eat my plants that literally they're the only plants in my yard with one inch thorns coming off of them. And my dog decided to eat those. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> so I was like, really dog, you got all these other plants and you ate the ones with the thorns. Okay. Um, all right, let's jump on to questions. And if you have not yet given us a thumbs up on this video, please uh, do. Yes. Uh, apples. Uh, somebody saying to do a sour with apples. Uh, yes. That's my, that's my wife. She's still making oh, fun of you on never the tart mind. fruits. Yeah. I did, did not even look at that. I'm just reading comments. Yeah. Why is she sa- First what? question. Yesterday we taste tested a beer that was one month old uh, for the duration te- for duration testing. And for the first time, the beer was uh, insanely carbonated and tasted like dirt. Was a really good brown honey ale. Oh, that sounds like uh Hmm. Tasted like dirt? That, that sounds like... That's s- a contamination yeah, thing. Yeah, some <laughs> wild contamination. I'm trying to wonder... Yeah, especially because if it's overcarbonated, that's kind of like big red flag there that something else got in there and fermented it. I don't know why it would taste like dirt, though. That's a, that's a different, yeah. strange descriptor. I'm wondering if it's patio or... It was a really good honey brown ale. Uh, I'm wondering, if, depending on how you added the honey, maybe th- now the honey would be hard to get infected. So, yeah. Yeah, I would just say, yeah, try to fix that for next time. I'm, I'm sure. Unfortunately, that beer is probably a goner. But uh, for next time, just pay attention to probably it might even be some contamination in the bottles. Um, if not all the bottles probably are. The mo- yeah, the most common contamination point. Yeah, if not all the bottles are, are tasting that way, then uh, then it's probably a, you didn't get the bottles quite cleaned out well enough. So. 
Um, best yeast for sour beer? Oh, that's actually a great question. Uh, our go-to is almost always going to be a uh, German ale strain. Yeah. And that's literally just because it's, it's a really tolerant strain to, um, to those lower pHs. Um, so that's kind of our go-to. With that said, you can play around with other strains, um, but for the most part. Yeah. Uh, that's for Dadby for like kettle sours especially. Yeah. But, uh, I mean, we do when we do our Solera, we usually start with uh, uh, blend of Saison strains for the Solera. Um, French Saison is obviously just a nice yeah. killer, and it's going to take away the chance for bacteria that we don't want in there to get in there, uh, which is one of the reasons that we like French Saison in our Solera barrel. But, um, yeah, those are the two. More. Somebody Homebrew for Life says Reddit's the best media source for, for brewing. Actually, I've, it seems like it's pretty good. Um, I mean, there's there's definitely some mixed uh, mixed information out there, but just like yeah. everywhere else on the Internet. Yeah, people have mixed opinions on Reddit, too. I've, I've um, liked it so far. I need to get on it more, but I'm also really uh, scatterbrained and busy. <laughs> Somebody uh, is saying they just use rhubarb, blackberries, and melon and a goza not together. Why? Why not together? <laughs> you only live once. That's right. Do it all. You only live once. Throw them all together. Uh, H4L's doing a <laughs> quike milkshake sour. Okay. Which uh, I, think is, I think is a great idea. I actually have a similar beer going on right now, but without the milkshake. Yeah, we I think we've already done a couple of those even. Well, that's what um, we got in the four barrel right now is a yeah. quike, quike IPA. Oh, we got a quike IPA on tap. We get a sour quike IPA on tap right now. We do have a sour quake IPA. In fact, it might even be a milkshake. Uh, like, <laughs> no, I don't think it was. No, that one wasn't? Okay. It's super tasty, though. Yeah. Uh, that one's got the, the pink gin stuff in it. Yeah. Super yummy. Yeah. Put cranberries in a hard cider. Mash. Wrong time of the year right now. Oh, yeah. Add some cinnamon and wait until Christmas. Okay. So for um, Diamond Rhodes is asking the amount of lactic acid in a five-gallon batch or pitching lacto in a five-gallon batch um, to uh, or, or doing lactic acid and pitching lacto to get the pH down quicker. Uh, took him almost three days uh, to get down to his pH before. Um, and, yeah, so we usually do some kind of a combination, either using lactic acid or acidulated malt to pre-acidify our wort. Um, if we use the acidulated malt, we'll throw that in right at the end of our mash um, just because we don't want to mess up our pH of our mash too much. Um, but we'll actually go pretty heavy, like a pound or two of acid malt um, to get us down to that lower pH. And then if you are going to pitch lacto, um, it's going to depend on what strain you're pitching, but most of those are going to like it um, at least above 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and that might be why your souring process is going a little slower. Um, if it's down at room temperature, it'll get there, but it'll take it probably the better part of a week, which means you got to pay like super, super close attention to your sanitation process. That's using plantarum. Plantarum can yeah. do go pretty fast at room temperature. Yeah. Um, someone's asking about kombucha beer. Uh, with the SCOBY. Uh, so that's actually, SCOBYs are a mixed culture that really don't like beer as a growth medium. Uh, the best way to do kombucha beer, it has been done, uh, but the people that do it, there's a, there's a brewery in New York that does that solely in, uh, uh, in casks or barrels or something like that. But what they'll do is they'll actually blend already fermented kombucha into their sour beers to make a hybridized beer that still can age out um, differently. But oh, kombucha. Uh, but yeah, as a as a culture, kombucha will not do a good job of fermenting your beer the way you want it to. So <laughs> I recommend kind of making kombucha and then making beer and then blending them about eighty percent beer, twenty percent kombucha at the end. Uh, key lime sour with lactose. Yes, I think we might have to steal that idea. Um, now kombucha. We made kombucha beer ba basically. <laughs> yeah, we, we uh, yeah that was our failed kombucha experiment at our old shop. We tried to do kombucha and uh, within like. It was less than a day, and it was under full fermentation. <laughs> Fully alcoholic. That's what happens when you've got a bunch uh, of, you know, really nasty, not nasty, really strong wild yeast. Floating yeah, around. I mean, we had it ten feet away from our grain mill, so you're. Yeah. I mean, what what do you think's gonna happen there? <laughs> do you add lactose to the boil? Yes, you do add lactose to the boil. I add it in the very end of the boil. Um, yep. Uh, you want to do it for a strawberry br blueberry Berliner? The easiest way to do that. The fly trying to get me is to uh, when you yeah, so add the lactose, chill everything down to about 120 degrees, pitch your lactobacillus, and then a day later, go ahead and pitch your German ale yeast. Ooh, that should be a good day. Uh, Here's a great question that just popped up. Um, dry hopping bag or no bag? Ooh, ooh, ooh. The, the ultimate debate. 
That kind of depends. Yeah. Um, so bags will make it more difficult for your uh, your your beer to to fully absorb everything that's in there. Uh, that said, with no bag, you also can run the risk of some extra grassy material. Um, I would say bag if you don't have a way to filter it out afterwards. That means transferring it to a corny keg and then transferring it from the corny keg into your final keg, uh, which could be another corny keg, but actually using that corny keg as a bright tank. If you don't have a way to really fine out those hot, that hot material, then you got to bag it. you got to have a way to make sure that it gets out of there. Uh, that said, if you do have a way to fine out, yeah. or especially if you have a filter in process, uh, then go ahead and throw them right in and then just filter it out in three days. So, you know, here's just a really simple approach, right? Um, you buy yourself a really fancy uh, conical fermenter, all stainless, of course. All stainless, um, yeah. Let the beer ferment in it, uh, hook it up to a pump, and dry hop straight into the fermenter with a, um, of course, kind of like the vacuum lock thing that costs like $200. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, add your dry hops that way, recirculate it for 24 hours warm with the pump, uh, and then crash it overnight and then dump those hops out immediately to avoid any of that grassy material. Everybody can do that, right? That's Everyone can do that. Yeah, yeah, like it's it's only like a couple thousand plus in Here's equipment. Here's the way you <laughs> actually do it. Just get in a, a vertical system uh, uh, with a hot <laughs> medium that is completely filtered in the center and have the beer constantly circulating like a, like a continuous fermentation through <laughs> that hot medium with different plates. Completely filled it out by the time it gets to the bottom of the fermenter uh, and then obviously dry hop it again through a series of plates that go into your bright yeah, tank. Or just run the whole beer through a centrifugal pump to, to filter it. Too. Yeah, just yeah, get that, a centrifuge. That only costs you like a half million, no big deal. Uh, no, I we're, think they have, they have centrifuges for under $50,000. <laughs> we're screwing with people now. Um, now, ultimately, bag or no bag, um, you will get good results um, as long as you're not leaving the hops in the beer for too long. That's, that's I think, the biggest takeaway of that question is uh, – is is whether or not um, bagging bagging is fine um, no bag is also fine um, but just make sure that you're not for one getting those hops into whatever you know bottles or kegs um, and then two um, you're not leaving those hops in contact with the beer for we try not to leave it on there for more than three or four days um, that's sort of our max there so um, yeah anyway on to our next one um, somebody's saying they got a hop spider um, let it sit for a couple days yeah yeah, hot material settles out. So uh, we got somebody asking about spontaneous fermentation uh, for a lambic that wanted to do this fall. Spontaneous fermentation is a wild game to play. Uh, so th the best way to truly do it would actually be to have your fermenter in uh, basically in a very, very clean room or box that you can probably build uh, that would have walls that are higher than the top of your open fermenter. And it would have a roof. And it would basically be like a swan necking from... Uh, the the vessel that you have it in. Uh, basically, you want to make sure that things that you don't want in there can't get in there, and only the good bacteria can. And even then, it's kind of a you'd have to have a window on it so you knew knew when it started fermenting. And then as soon as it started fermenting, you'd want to transfer it into a closed system. Ooh, somebody did a kettle sour with a uh, mango and pineapple. Sorry, got distracted there. Now I want that in my mouth. Yeah. And also, yes, if you do have unlimited money, you can pretty much do anything. That yes. is a fact. Which is why <laughs> we're pretty proud of the brewery that we've built because we have very, very limited money slash uh. not a lot of money. <laughs> and we've made some pretty cool beers with it. It's good old uh. fashioned ingenuity can also do things. I can just see like everybody else watching us now going dicks. <laughs> <laughs> Those guys. Uh. As we start like posting videos about us buying $2,500 fermenters. Uh, pretty much. But now they pay for themselves. So it's, you know. The, the more money we, we, the more beer we sell, the more cool things we can buy. Yeah. But we're doing it the slow way. There's a lot of people that can just start breweries with 250000 to a million dollars, and they have really nice equipment right off the bat. And then they we hire started a brewer. for much, much less <laughs> and are slowly working our way up. They hire a brewer so they don't have to go down and, and uh, Do spray things. down walk-ins and take nasty old grains and yeah, try to compost them. We need a seller person. <laughs> if anyone wants to move here and be a seller person for, for free, you can. Uh, we'll oh, yeah, and, and bring a seller with them, too. That's the <laughs> other thing. Yeah, they need to yeah. bring a seller with them. Uh, anyways, I did a rye IPA and threw the hops in directly for the first time. No bag. Wow, huge utilization difference. Yes, it is. That is yeah, that is uh, the big difference, really, is that you will get a lot more utilization, um, be it in the boil or be it in the dry hop as well. Um, so it's just one of those things. You just got to be on it about, about getting those hops off the tree before they sit for too long. I figure or use cryo hops, you know, that's, that's, I that's just realized that I, I had a thought that I wanted to add to this video and I forget why or when, but that was the difference between a conical fermenter and the egg shaped fermenter. 
Oh, Remember that's that. for, no, that's a different video. Then. Never mind. I got it. I was going to do a, different videos. Yeah, yeah. got a graphic idea. I'm I mean, you do get, you'll probably get more utilization in a, in a flat bottom fermenter even yeah, versus a conical when you're dry hopping. So. Those cement egg fermenters actually, they, they're a really interesting proposition for, because uh, they use cement because it's porous. It's actually really commonly used in the wine world. And it also offers the chance to have a kind of natural clarification process. Um, that said, cement eggs are really expensive. Um, especially the ones that have the nice like front door manways and bottom ports and everything like that. But yeah. All righty. Well, uh, maybe a couple more questions and we are going to finish out this uh, show. Thank you everyone for tuning in. Hey, everybody like, I don't see, I don't see enough likes on there. <laughs> We're going to keep pestering you. We're going to keep pestering you on that. Um, so uh, yeah, it looks like uh, people are, no? Okay, no more questions. Well, maybe we'll just close her out then. Oh, there was one thing. Uh, the All the hops into Frazzled Penguin's Rye IPA. Um, plugged his dip tube. Yes, that's uh, that's one of the reasons that we recommend filtration. Between that and the fact that also, the um, depending on temperature swings, all the plant yeah. material that's in there can give you a grassy texture. You don't want that plant material in there for too long. Yeah, if you're working on like something like a brew bucket, I can definitely see, like I would definitely go the bag route for and try to suspend that bag actually because yeah. you will you will plug dip tubes with hops. Um, try to make sure you can filter it out at some point. That is what they're really good at. Um, bam, already liked. Hit, Hit 100 <laughs> likes, chug a beer. <laughs> I'm not opposed to that. Peter will chug a beer. <laughs> actually, we should probably... Call this one up. We got to get open. So thank you everyone for tuning in today. Um, great show as always. And uh, yeah, tune in next week. Uh, we do this every Sunday at 8:45 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. Um, and for those of you that don't always wake up that early, especially like oh no, East Coast. East Coast this is like noon. So um, yeah, it's nighttime over in Europe. So everybody's cool on that. Um, and uh, yeah, so. I guess we'll uh, we'll see you guys next week then. Yeah, and somebody, uh, while I'm doing that, do uh, the does boil time matter to kill off lacto? No, it doesn't. Yeah, no, lacto will die once you get it above uh, about 130 degrees Fahrenheit. So um, that's more or less the threshold. So you don't even have to bring it up to a total boil. When do you add spruce tips? Spruce tips. Uh, the very end. I'm, I'm, I the, the tip. Yeah, whirlpool. Say, say bye, and I'll do it then. All right, bye everyone. Mm-hmm.